Okay, so welcome to our lesson today, and today we're going to look at malaria. So basically, we can define malaria as this is an acute tropical protozoa infection caused by an infected female Anopheles mosquito characterized by uh, fever, uh, generalized body malaise, uh, nausea, and vomiting. So when it comes to malaria, you're going to realize that patients mainly they are going to experience uh, a raised body temperature. So it can indicate the presence of uh, malaria in the body. Some patients are going to experience uh, nausea and vomiting which go hand in hand. So some patients may be feeling like they want to vomit and some patients may actually be vomiting. And the other characteristic of clinical manifestation of uh, of malaria is in generalized body malaise so these patients may experience generalized body weakness which could indicate the presence of the, the malaria bacteria or uh, protozoa infection in the body system so when it comes to to malaria we have different species that can cause malaria we have the plasmodium falciparum so we have the plasmodium we have the plasmodium falciparum so we have the plasmodium falciparum I don't know if you can see the spelling so unfortunately um, you cannot see clearly the spelling but falciparum is f-a-l-c-i-p-a-r-u-m the other species is plasmodium vivax plasmodium vivax vivax is v i v a x then the other plasmodium that we have for malaria is plasmodium ovale so the other plasmodium is called plasmodium ovale which is z o v a l e the other um, uh, species is plasmodium malaria so the other causative organism is plasmodium Malaria. Malaria is M A L A R I A E. So basically, those are the species that are common, or th that commonly cause malaria. That commonly cause malaria. Okay. So we move on. So those ba basically, those are the species that causes malaria. And now we can move on to the mode of transmission. So when it comes to malaria, for someone to be infected or get infected with malaria, the common thing is that you have to be bitten by an infected Anopheles mosquito. So this Anopheles mosquito must be carrying the one of the bacteria or the species that we have mentioned above, and then these are injected in your bloodstream, and then you develop symptoms or a condition of malaria. The other mode of transmission is through blood transfusion. So in cases where the blood is not properly properly screened, you realize that some blood may be contaminated by a malaria parasite. So as uh, as much as health professionals might get uh, the blood for transfusion, they shouldn't forget to screen for malaria and other conditions. We know the blood can contain hepatitis, can have the HIV virus, and can have other diseases in it. So if uh, in cases where the blood is not properly screened, it can predispose individuals to being transfused or given blood that contain the malaria parasite. So transfusion is one of the, uh, the, the, the cause or mode of transmission of uh, malaria. The other mode of transmission is through transplacental. This can happen from mother to child. That's why you realize that women whenever they are pregnant in, in the cases of zambia you need to give or put the the, the, the patient on anti-malarial drugs such as fancida so you are trying to prevent in case of uh, this woman suffering from malaria you try to prevent uh, that malaria from going to the child so this can also be transmitted through the placenta and uh, before the child is even born so those are the common mode of transmission of malaria so when it comes to transmission of malaria we're talking of being bitten by a female anopheles mosquito transfused with blood containing malaria parasite or through transplacental uh, uh, mode of uh, transmission meaning this is coming from the mother to the child now let's talk about the life cycle of uh, 
malaria. When it comes to the life cycle of malaria, this involves two hosts. So when it comes to the life cycle of malaria, it is going to involve two hosts, basically. The first host should be a human being and also a mosquito should be present. So for a, for a life cycle of, mos uh, of malaria to be completed, it needs an actual human being and the second thing it needs is a mosquito. So if there is no mosquito and this human being has a malaria, it means the cycle is broken down, it cannot be transmitted further to other individuals because the, the cycle to be completed it needs two beings or two hosts, which is a human being and a mosquito. So the mosquito, the life cycle of uh, malaria, the, it has the sexual reproductive phase which takes place in the mosquito. So the sexual reproductive phase, it takes place in the mosquito, while the asexual reproductive phase occurs in a human being. So you have the sexual part, meaning there's a female and a male uh, protozoa or sporozoids being, uh, being involved in the production of, uh, or in the production of other malaria causative organisms such as the schizons and other things. Then you have the, the, the sexual part, the asexual part, which, or the asexual phase, in other words, which should take place in a human being. So those are the two phases, basically, that are there as you are talking about the cycle of malaria. So even as you are looking at the, 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 the life cycle, make sure you talk about the sexual part and the asexual part, then you'll be home and dry. And remember, as, I was, as I've always said, when you're writing the, the diagrams uh, for tropical medicine, make sure you put a heading. So a heading is going to carry marks, which is about two marks. Then after a heading, you need to show a well-labeled diagram. So by a well-labeled diagram, I mean if you cannot draw the actual, actual diagrams, like showing a mosquito, showing this mosquito, buying a human being, that is an actual diagram. You can use tables and describe what is being involved at each stage. So that's the only two way you can describe or draw a diagram uh, in GNC with whatever question you'll be given. That requires a diagram. Remember a title, a well-labeled diagram, meaning in life cycles you can use tables, you can draw actual diagrams. Then you'll be okay. Make sure you give correct descriptions, then you'll get full marks for diagrams. Let's start with stage one. So in stage one in the life cycle of malaria, a female mosquito that has already fed on a blood meal from an infected person will bite or bites another person and injects sporozoids which are found in the saliva. So the first stage talks about a mosquito which has bitten an infected human being. And this mosquito which has bitten an infected human being is going to take a blood meal in another person. And as it is taking an, a blood meal, it releases the saliva. So it is in this saliva of, uh, of the mosquito that is where we find the sporozoids. So the sporozoids are going to be ejected or injected in this human being. So that is about stage one. Then we move on to stage two. So on, on stage two, this is also known as the liver stage. So stage two is also called the liver stage. At this point, the sporozoids, they rapidly enter the liver cells and transform into schizons. So they transform into schizons. So schizons is S-C-H-I-Z-O-N-T-S. So they, they are going to enter, the sporozoids are going to rapidly enter the river cells. After they enter the river cells, they are going to transform into schizons that reproduce asexually to generate larger numbers of merozoids. So schizons, once they enter the liver cells, they are going to reproduce asexually, meaning they, need, they don't have to mate for them to reproduce. So they are going to reproduce asexually to, to produce large numbers of uh, merozoids. So merozoids are going to be produced from uh, the schizons. And schizons are the ones which are trans being transformed from uh, sporozoids once they enter the liver cells. 
okay okay so hopefully we are together up to that point we move on to stage three on stage three after five to after between five to twenty days the merozoites rupture the liver cells and begin the, ero the erythrocytic stage so between the fifth day and the twentieth day in between here it could be the actual fifth day the merozoites are, go are going to rupture the liver cells and begin the erythrocytic stage or the erythrocytic cycle so during this erythrocytic cycle the merozoites invade the red blood cells in the peripheral blood system where they feed and multiply further resulting into large na or a large increase of uh, parasite population so uh, once they, they they rupture from the liver cells the merozoites are going now to attack or invade the red blood cells so in the red blood cells they are going to reproduce further and uh, have large numbers of the same parasite uh, in, in this human being so the release of merozoites produces the characteristic fever in the patient so once the merozoites are released from the liver cells they are going to attack the red blood cells once they attack the red blood cells they are going to result into production of uh, excess levels of merozoites and because there are, a, there are a lot of them being produced it is going to result in the fever that is commonly seen in this human being okay now let's move on to stage four so on stage four after the asexual cycle so after the asexual cycle has ended in the human being some merozoites are going to develop into gametocytes so in this same human being the asexual stage has ended in the liver cells the, some have ruptured and started attacking the red blood cells now on stage four some uh, some merozoites they develop into gametocytes so they are, they are going to develop into the gam into gametocytes which is the sexual form which is ingested by the mosquito sucking blood so the merozoites uh, the, the, the gametocytes rather the merozoites which have developed into gametocytes are the ones which are going to be ingested by this other mosquito which is going to be feeding on the human blood so once it is ingested by this uh, uh, by this mosquito now we move on to stage six so that's where stage four ends it is where the merozoites develop to develop into gametocytes and gametocyte is the sexual form of the parasite so this is this this sexual form is what is ingested by this parasite or by the mosquito and once it is ingested that's the end of uh, stage four we move on to stage five so on stage five so stage five is the the, the, the what the, uh, the, the gametocyte has been ingested so in the mosquito gut the male and the female gametes merge from the gametocyte so from the gametocyte two uh, two two forms are going to be produced which is the male and the female gamete are going to merge from this gametocyte which was ingested at stage four and after they may they, they merge they are going to fuse into zygotes which migrate into the gut wall where they produce the oocytes or oocysts which is double o c y s t s so they are uh, the, in the mosquito gut the male and female gametes they merge from the gametocytes and fuse into zygotes which migrate into the gut wall where they produce the oocytes so each oocytes can generate up to approximately 1,000 sporozoids. So once these merge, they can produce approximately uh, 1,000. One can produce up to 1,000 sporozoids, which is uh, a lot, a lot as compared to human beings who are just able to reproduce one or two children in nine months. So after two weeks, you realize that the sporozoids see, migrate now to the mosquito saliva so after two weeks the sporozoids that have been reproduced by the merging uh, female and male gamete they can now migrate to the mosquitoes salivary gland this at this stage now they become highly infective 
after nine days from the time they had migrated to the salivary gland and then the cycle will resume again if a next person is affected by the effective stage of the uh, of the protozoa of the parasite it means the cycle will continue into that human being the next human being again that cycle will continue until it can be broken off so the the best way is to eliminate the cause by spraying uh, our environment sleeping under a mosquito net it means you are trying to break the cycle and then malaria can be eliminated so currently within lusaka it is considered a malaria free zone meaning if you are suffer from malaria it could be that it was brought from anywhere else but currently Mal uh, lusaka is malaria free zone so the cycle has uh, has been broken in lusaka meaning we are free hopefully we are together up to that point and that is the end of the cycle of uh, malaria so now let's talk about the clinical features or the clinical manifestation of malaria so the clinical manifestation the first one we are going to talk about is fever so this happens when the red blood cells burst so fever due to bursting of the red blood cells which could be accompanied by slight chills and the fever mainly uh, ranges from 39 degrees celsius to 41 degrees celsius so fever is due to rupture or bursting of red blood cells which is between 39 degrees to 41 degrees celsius and it is mainly accompanied by body chills the next um, and the next uh, clinical feature we can talk of is vomiting this is due to irritation of the GIT by the parasite so there is irritation of the gastrointestinal tract by the parasite which results into vomiting of this individual who has um, who has um, who has malaria the other clinical manifestation we can talk of is convulsions so some patients may bec become or may start to convulse and this is because of raised body temperature that's why in babies you are going to try as much as possible to control the body temperature because it may result into convulsions which are not good for the brain cells so these convulsions are more common in children who are less than three years okay the other symptom that we can look of is uh, is cough so coughing this comes as a result of severe vomiting so you realize that because of coughing uh, because of severe vomiting rather the patients might also experience coughing the other symptom is sweating sweating this comes as a result or this is due to sudden fall in temperature as the client begins to feel better so as the client begin, begins to feel better this patient might sweat profusely and this is due to sudden fall in the temperature in the body temperature okay the other symptom is your uh, body malaise some patients they may experience body generalized body weakness which we talked of in our definition and this is basically due to increased hemolysis of red blood cells or the increased bursting of uh, red blood cells as a result this patient may experience generalized body weakness so basically we have more more than five clinical manifestations meaning we are good to go so those are the uh, clinical manifestation or the symptoms of uh, malaria now before uh, we look at the pathophysiology of uh, uh, of malaria let us look at uh, the rigor stage or the riga stage uh, like rigomotis but the rigor stages of uh, malaria then we can look at the pathophysiology okay. okay so when it comes to the rigor stage or the rigor stages of malaria these are just uh, the common stages that malaria takes or the common manifestations of malaria and it, it follows some stage that involves a riga which is the, the first stage is a cold stage then we have a hot stage and the sweating stage and by the sweat the time the sweating stage is coming about it means the condition would have even been reducing or the patient would have been healed or taking um, or receiving healing so when it comes to management of malaria uh, therefore you need also to pay attention in your immediate care 
about the cold stage, the hot stage, and the sweating stage. Do interventions with those and then bring in the general management. Nevertheless, we'll talk about the management later on. So when it comes to the Riga stage, we have the cold stage. So the cold stage is characterized by shivering. So the, f the cold stage is basically characterized by shivering. There is, uh, there's, uh, there's intense feeling of cold. The lips and fingers, some, they become cyanotic. So basically this is uh, the cold stage. So we are saying the, the lips and the fingers may become cyanotic, they may become dry and pale during the cold stage, and in children there may be seizures also experienced during this stage. And this stage basically takes uh, about 15 to 60 minutes. So between 15 to an hour this patient is just going to experience uh, severe coldness. This is the first stage in the Riga clinical manifestation of uh, malaria. The second stage is called the hot stage. So this stage lasts uh, between two to six hours. So between two to six hours, the patient is going to be in a hot stage after being infected with it, the malaria parasite. And this is basically caused by the temperatures which could be above 41 degrees Celsius. And it is characterized by a full bound pulse uh, dry burning skin, intense headache, uh, nausea and vomiting can also be experienced during the hot stage. The, lat the last stage in the Riga clinical manifestation of malaria is the sweating stage. So during the sweating stage it lasts for about two to four hours and it is characterized by profuse sweating. The temperatures then they are going to fall rapidly below the normal temperatures. Uh, patient falls into a deep sleep at this point and on waking up the patient feels weak but normal and then you have uh, seen or you have seen some patients being covered in a blanket so that they sweat profusely and then after sweating they feel better so uh, according to tradition that is what is done but according to the normal stages of uh, how malaria should take place and how healing should happen during the, the sweating stage, the temperatures are going to fall rapidly. And once they fall rapidly below normal, the patient is then going to fall into a deep sleep. Uh, and then when they wake up, they're going to feel okay, but uh, they are going to feel weak. And you might realize that wherever you were sleeping, you find it is even wet. It means you have healed from malaria. So those are the right stages of uh, malaria when you talk of management also pay attention to the cold stage and do those interventions the hot stage and the other stages that are supposed to be attended to at a particular point in time so in your management add those headings and manage the patient nicely now we can go back and look at the the pathophysiology of malaria pathophysiology of malaria so first of physiology, firstly, a mosquito bite occurs and sporozoids are inoculated into the host bloodstream. So the first thing is that a mosquito bite is going to take place. Once, once that happens, the sporozoids are going to be released into the bloodstream of the host. So these sporozoids, they are going to migrate to the liver of the host for development and multiplication. This process is called the pre-erythrocytic uh, stage. It's called the pre-erythrocytic stage where the sporozoids have migrated to the liver cells and also they multiply and also mature. After that, the tissue schizos enlarges and divides to form thousands of merozoids. When merozoids are formed, the liver tissue ruptures and releases merozoids into the bloodstream. So once merozoids are formed, the, the liver cells will rupture. Once they rupture, they will release the merozoids into the bloodstream. Then in the bloodstream, the merozoids enters the red blood cells. In the red blood cells, the merozoids develops into ring, excuse, into ring forms which grow in size, becoming trophozoids. 
so in the red blood cells the merozoites are going to develop into ring forms which grow in size uh, in size becoming what we call trophozoites so these multiply and divide into a number of small merozoites and form schizons they form schizons the, merozo the merozoites are released by rupture of red blood cell membranes and enter new young red blood cells so they will continue feeding or entering or invading uh, new red blood cells after a period after a period some merozoites give rise to two sexual differentiated form of gametocytes a male and a female ready to be sucked by a mosquito once they are sucked by the mosquito uh, then the process eh, continues so at the point where the, 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 the rupturing of red blood cells is occurring, this is the point when this patient is going to experience severe fever, is going to be seen, uh, generalized body weakness, and also nausea and vomiting, all those things are going to be experienced by this patient. So basically that's how the pathophysiology of, um, of malaria happens. That's how the pathophysiology of malaria happens hopefully we are together up to that point so after talking about uh, we have defined malaria we have looked at the life cycle of malaria we have looked at the mode of transmission we have looked at the pathophysiology and also the life cycle of malaria and including also the species of malaria now we can talk about the management of uh, malaria so how can we manage malaria a patient who has uh, malaria so we are going to start with medical management when it comes to medical management basically we are looking at um, we'll start with the investigations five points on the investigations so some aims or objectives that we can put before management are maybe to eradicate the causative organism to prevent complication uh, maybe we can bring complications at the end to reduce the temperature to normal to treat the symptoms such as fever or diarrhea that can be experienced or nausea and vomiting and then to, to prevent complications of malaria you know that malaria is very dangerous at some point so you need to prevent the complication of uh, malaria so basically you need four aims or objectives to give you the four marks during uh, GNC examination the next heading now that we can look at is investigations so in uh, during investigations maybe you can uh, do history taking a history taking point it could be uh, history of uh, severe uh, or history of uh, well, severe uh, fever or raised body temperature or uh, basically a clinical manifestation history taking could be history of severe fever so the patient may may present with history of fever then uh, that could be an indication of uh, of uh, malaria or in other cases it could be history of uh, blood transfusion uh, remember we talked of a mode of transmission which can include the blood transfusion so it could be this patient received blood and then afterwards they develop uh, malaria after that we move on to physical examination so during physical examination the patient on uh, maybe on um, uh, during observations or physical examination interventions, the patient is going to present with the generalized body weakness. So the patient may, pre may present with generalized body weakness. Then on lab investigations, so on lab investigations, so on lab investigations we can do a rapid diagnostic test. So a rapid diagnostic test is going to come out positive for malaria which takes between 10 to 15 minutes then to come out positive for malaria uh, then other investigations that you can do are blood slide uh, apart from blood slide which is a uh, uh, which is RDT, you can also do a full blood count so a full blood count is going to show low hemoglobin levels leukocytosis and raise the erythrocyte segmentation rate you can do a lumbar puncture to rule out meningitis 
Uh, so you can do all those things. Um, you can do a lumbar patch to rule out meningitis when it comes to radiological investigations. So during radiological investigation, basically there are um, uh, little radiological investigations that you can do to confirm uh, uh, malaria. So many to be concentrated on the laboratory history checking and physical exam investigations. Maybe radiological investigation would be to rule out certain conditions, but not as a, a diagnostic test for malaria. Then when we come to treatment, the first line treatment of uncomplicated malaria is atimetha lumefantrine, according to uh, the Zambian uh, Ministry of Health guidelines. So uncomplicated malaria, you are going to give atimetha lumefantrine. So atimetha lumefantrine or coatium is going to be given in uncomplicated malaria. And uh, this atimetha or coatium should not be given to pregnant women, meaning pregnant women, you are going to give them fancida. Fancida cannot be given to a pregnant woman who is in their first trimester. Therefore, during the first trimester, you are going to give quinine. Quinine, which is uh, 10 milligrams per kg body weight, you're going to give it 8 hourly for 5 to 10 days in complicated malaria. So the side effects of uh, quinine, it is uh, tinnitus, headache, and also abdominal pain. There's also nausea, visual disturbance, confusion, hypersensitivity reaction, hypoglycemia, and also renal failure in severe cases. So uh, the nursing implication is that you need to give quinine with uh, glucose and also let the patient take in a lot of uh, water. Fancy that the dose is 10 milligrams per kg body weight or you can give three tablets to someone who is above 45, who is weighing above 45 kilograms. You can give three tablets or you can give um, 10 kilo. Uh, 10 milligrams rather per kg body weight 10 milligrams per kg body weight side effects are dizziness headache anorexia general body weakness so this this drug can also cause general body weakness the nursing implication the first thing is that explain the side effects of the drug to the patient then encourage the client to be taking in a lot of fluids or water so for coatum, for coatum, the dose is you need to take in 16, uh, 16 tablets, which are divided into five doses. So 16 tablets are divided into five doses, meaning you need to take four initial tablets, then four after eight hours, four after 24 hours, and then four on the second, uh, on the second day and four on the second day so it is four on the uh, on initial meaning the start dose you need to take four uh four, ta four, four tablets then after that after eight hours you need to take another four tablets then the next the third dose is going to be after 24 hours from the uh, from the which is uh, from the third dose from the third dose not 24 hours after the second dose then uh, the fourth dose is going to be on the second day and then after that you also take the last dose which, which means you need to take five doses of coatem if you are giving coatem side effects of coatem coatem is um, uh, so the side effects of coatem basically coatem doesn't have uh, a lot of side effects but you might experience nausea or vomiting or those but it's contraindicated in pregnant women and the individuals who are weighing below 10 kg shouldn't be given um, shouldn't be given um, coatem so in currently in Zambia for severe complicated malaria, uh, what is being given is um, is atesonate. 
So in Zambia, counterintuitacinet is what is being given for severe complicated malaria. So a tesunate you give 2.4 milligrams per kg body weight at first contact. So you are going to give that dose. The next dose is going to be 12 hours from the first dose. The next dose is going to be 12 hours from the first dose. Then the third dose is going to be 24 hours from the third dose. The, 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 dose, the other dose is going to be 24 hours from the third dose. And then the patient can also take the last dose 24 hours from the, uh, from the third dose. So a tesunate is currently being given in severe complicated malaria and not uh, uh, quinine, which was being given previously. So you need to take note of those uh, things. So that's it about um, malaria, meaning when you, are, when you are told to give three drugs in, uh, uh, on medical management during GNC, please, I repeat again, mention a uh, drug of choice. Of course, paracetamol can work to reduce the fever, but doesn't mean paracetamol is a drug of choice uh, for, for malaria. It's going to be given when symptoms are present. So talk about fancy, talk about um, atesunate, talk about quinine, talk about coatem, all those drugs. Mention their mode of action, nursing implication to side effect, their dose, their route, and, and everything about the drug. Okay. Then we can move on to the nursing management. Okay. So when it comes to the nursing management of malaria, basically it is going to depend or uh, to depend on what condition the patient has been brought uh, on at the hospital. So uh, if it's severe malaria where the patient had even collapsed or they are convulsing, it means uh, you're going to do resuscitative measures, meaning you're going to adhere to the airway, breathing and circulation headings but in cases where uh, the patient just have um, uh, just have normal normal malaria which is not severe your immediate headings should be management of the after your aims or your objectives you're going to put uh, headings such as the management of the of the code stage of riga so on management of the code stage of riga you need to talk about saying I will switch on the heater to promote uh, comfort. I will add extra linen to keep the patient warm and promote comfort. Uh, you can also administer oxygen therapy if the patient is cyanotic. So you are going to do interventions uh, that are seen during the cold stage. So meaning your first heading if this is just general nursing management or just malaria without complications you talk about uh, management of the cold stage. If this is a malaria with a complication, let's say the patient came unconscious, it means you are going to do resuscitative measures. After resuscitation, you then you start with uh, management of the cold stage of uh, Riga and give those uh, points. After management of the cold stage of Riga, then you can talk about management of the hot stage of uh, Riga. On this stage, you can say, I'll remove extra linen to promote heat loss. I will switch off the heater in order to cool the patient. I will switch on the fan to promote heat loss, thereby reducing the temperature. I will do oral care to moisten the mouth and pro uh, promote appetite and prevent halitosis. If the patient feeds, I will give uh, care of a patient uh, of, a, of a fitting patient. So remember on the hot stage, the patient might uh, begin to convulse. It means you're also going to do care to the patient who's fitting or who's convulsing. Your next heading is going to be the sweating stage of Riga. During the sweating stage of Riga, talk about I will change uh, the, pe the, the wet linen to promote comfort. I will bath the patient to remove perspiration and promote comfort. I will offer copious oral fluids to prevent dehydration. I will observe the IV line to promote recovery. So once you talk about those immediate care headings, now you can bring in other headings from the aprofenema. So if you, if you want, you can talk about now the environment. You're going to nurse this patient in a well, um, 
uh, ventilated environment befitting the stage of Riga. If it's in the uh, warm stage, the patient is in the hot stage, cold stage, or sweating stage. But make sure you nest this patient in the acute bay because malaria may progress and may worsen so you can nest this patient in the acute bay. The other heading should be about uh, keeping the environment clean, a uh, well lit environment and other points. Apart from that you can talk about, you can now bring in observation. So you can do observation, take the temperature, pulse and resp respirations and PP of the patient for baseline information apart from that you can observe the riga stage you can observe the cold stage you can also observe uh, the settling stage to which will show how uh, the condition is progressing anything else can also be observed under observation as a heading you can bring in psychological care depending on the condition of the patient you can talk about why they are being isolated or where, why they are being nest, where they are being nest to, the condition that they have, and everything about the condition. Let the patient verbalize, attend to their concerns, involve them in the care, and all those interventions in psychological care. Hygiene is also important. You can promote hygiene and talk about points on hygiene. If at all you haven't used them on the sweating stage of Riga. You can also bring in another uh, point which is important, the nutrition point. This patient needs to, to receive proper nutritious or nutritious meals to help them in their recovery. So make sure you talk about also nutrition of the patient. Apart from that, you can talk about um, uh, what other heading apart from before we reach elimination. We can talk about... Um, uh, yeah, uh, position which is not so cardinal, which is not so cardinal. The position would depend on the, um, the situation of the patient. If the patient is unconscious, you are going to nurse them in the sofa in position until they recover, then you position them in semi powerless. But position as a point should come, um, you know, should come before observations if you are putting it there. Uh, exercise not so cardinal but you can do passive exercises since the patient might be uh, you might be experiencing generalized body weakness so for activity sake and to promote circulation you can do passive exercises to this patient and increase the, the nature of exercises as the condition improves then elimination as your last heading you need to check the input and output this patient might be sweating uh, profusely meaning you need to ensure that they don't go into dehydration so you need to ensure the input matches the output in terms of elimination and ensure that the patient is passing urine and other things uh, if IEC is not given as your last question it means you can also talk about IEC talk about um, covering themselves the patients covering themselves uh, with long sleeved clothes so that they leave no room for mosquito bites. Talk about use of um, mosquito repellents, cutting down long, uh, long grasses, and also pools of water. So you talk about all those points in your IEC, and also the patient um, uh, what uh, review dates adhering to the review dates. Say the patient comes for review dates. So if you're putting them in heading, talk about uh, the, the medication, talk about review date as a heading, so medication as your heading, review date as a, as a heading, um, then also talk about um, other things, other things such as, uh, so like hygiene, nutrition, all those can be grouped as uh, headings, infection prevention as another heading so if you, you you see that there are a lot of marks on IEC it means you need to give your IEC using headings in that manner then there are other points which may not fall on any of the headings meaning just bring them at the end but arrange your answers in a systematic manner thank you for taking time to 
uh, to listen to this uh, lecture for malaria hopefully it is helpful you can ask uh, the question on our whatsapp group uh, bring in suggestions and uh, yeah you can we can chat from there or leave a comment on this same um, video on YouTube then we'll be able to attend to your questions uh, next time uh, we are going to continue with um, with medicine which should be on Monday thank you so much enjoy your weekend and hopefully this coronavirus thing disappears as soon as possible stay blessed self-isolate and do not move around unless it is necessary okay see you next time thank you so much for watching this video